So we're going to whiz through these questions and we'll see how we get on. But keep writing, but I'll be... John, thank you. Great. I know who this John is. <laughs> That's an easy one. I'm glad you like the talk. Uh, next question. Could you give a, clini a short clinically relevant discussion about the CD markers? That's a bit technical, so I won't get too stuck in it. But just to remind you, CD markers, these are the proteins that are from the surface of the cells. And it's just really an identity parade. And the number refers to an international collaborative agreement, one to, I think we're up uh, beyond 200 now, which are saying that's this protein, that one's that protein. They could be A, B, C, D, E, or have any code, but it's like a fingerprint. And if you've got this combination of markers, so follicular lymphoma tends to be CD10 positive, 5 negative, CLL is 5 positive, 23, weak CD20. It's just a code used in the lab. There was a phase of trying to use the code for prognostic reasons, CD38, CD49B, but I, the, I just don't think we should get stuck in it. Uh, so hopefully that's covering off that one. How about any discussion on CLL spreading to the brain, to the CSF and pituitary gland? So I do hope this is online. It's a poor, unfortunate patient, if they're referring to them, it's extraordinarily rare. Um, and genuinely, in 20 years of managing CLL, I've come across it three times that I remember. Um, it requires its own very specialist treatment. Um, CLL can respond to brain-targeted therapies. It is very challenging. The BTK inhibitors can penetrate the brain, and zanabrutinib probably would be our drug of choice at the moment if we were looking for brain-targeting uh, 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 drugs for very specific reasons. Next question, how do you assess the prospects for CAR-T? Um, when is this viable? So CAR-T is a very, it's a remarkable technology. So this is now approved in the NHS for relapsed high-grade lymphoma, third line. It's approved for relapsed mantle cell lymphoma, third line. And it is, it's almost space age. When you sit there with the patients and say, well, look, we're going to harvest off your T cells, you go upstairs to level 10, harvest them off, we put them in the bag, we fly them to California, they do all of this magic. You can go in a bit more detail, but magic is the way I see it. Your cells are grown up with a very specific molecular target inserted. They come back, I think they go back via Holland, could be wrong. Then they come back to Cambridge, you come into the hospital, we give you a bit of conditioning chemo to damp down your own rejection responses. You infuse your new cells, which have got the magic genomic modification, and the new cells attack your lymphoma. Sets up this huge storm. We've been doing CAR-T in Cambridge now for a couple of years, and our data, I don't want to sound like I'm you know, praising the home team, but our data are amazing. And I'm not involved with the CAR-T team, really, only peripherally. So I'm praising my colleagues, but it is remarkable in the world of lymphoma. But CLL is a strange thing, because historically, the very first CAR-Ts were done in CLL. So everyone assumes CLR would lead the way. But one of the problems is T cells are not particularly healthy in CLR patients. And you need to have good T cells as your tool to work with to make your CAR-T. And so when people have been doing clinical trials with CAR-T, with CLR there have been constant problems. There have been ways of addressing it giving ibrutinib as a drug to tickle the T-cells. It's a strange thing, but it works. To try and make the CAR-T more effective. But repeatedly, when we've tried to set up trials, so years ago I tried to set up a CAR-T trial in Cambridge. We were all ready to go, and the company pulled it. We had another one we were just about to open, and it got pulled again at Global. So we're not sure why. It might be because the global market for CAR-T and CLL will always be relatively small so many effective drugs, new things coming which are just so much easier and CAR-T is highly complex. I don't know. But if you had to say to me, what are the prospects for CAR-T coming for CLL, I'd have to say, unfortunately, very slim. We now got approval for Richter's transformation if you meet criteria, so that's the high grade, but that's a separate conversation. So those are the online questions. Uh, so, how common is bleeding as a side effect from acalabrutinib? Are there other possible causes? So BTK inhibitors have this aspirin-like effect on platelets. So many of you in this room might be, might be taking a mini-dose aspirin. It's very popular because it is used by cardiology doctors to reduce the chances of stroke. And aspirin 
uh, stops platelets from clumping together. Platelets are your little cells in the blood that are important when you cut yourself and they bleed. BTK inhibitors, and there's a bit of variation between them, that, that, but they all have this slight tendency, give this effect on the platelets. They stop them clumping together so well. So many people notice bruising. Some unfortunate people do notice more in the way of nosebleeds or gum bleeds and that type of thing. Thankfully, for most people, it's uh, an inconvenience. It's not a really serious thing. Uh, but just occasionally, you find yourself fiddling with the doses. And the other question, are there other possible causes? Well, of course, anything that's bleeding related needs a little bit of thought to check there aren't any other surprises, sort of general medical things. Um, but if you're on acalabrutinib and you've got this tendency to bleed, it's probably that. Sometimes, older folk, they're on blood thin as well, as well, because of things like atrial fibrillation. And if you combine a blood thinner with a BTK inhibitor, clearly that will increase your bleeding risk as well. Many people can be on the two together, but it needs a bit of supervision and thought. Is it possible for a fully mutated patient to slide into unmutated? Now, that's an easy one, because actually you cannot evolve your mutational status. It is a fixed feature of your CLL. In contrast with your 17Ps, 11Qs, 13Qs, etc., etc., where there is clearly clonal evolution. So your cells, after a round of treatment, can evolve and pick up these extra genetic abnormalities. The mutated or unmutated IGHV is a fix. If you have mutated IGHV, you had venetoclax, you're in remission, and then you relapse with unmutated, you've got a new CLL. You've been unlucky, and you've got CLL for a second time, which can very rarely happen, but basically it's a fix. Are there any gene pools globally with a predisposition to CLL? Good question. So CLL does vary around the world. There are some populations which have fewer, and I really hope I'm not wrong here, Asian, African, lower than uh, Western Europeans, higher. All of our diseases are slightly variable. Um, I don't want to embarrass myself by saying the wrong thing, because are these questions going online as well? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't want to commit myself. <laughs> that data will be out there. Uh, next question. Why are relapsed patients offered VR and not VO? Mm, yeah. So we inherit history. We are where we are because of trials that have been done. And in medicine, unfortunately, or fortunately, depend on your view of regulation, you can't just look at data and say, well, you know what? I think we'll give that. You have to give it within the constraints of what is approved and what you're allowed to do. So in the relapsed trials, venetoclax was paired up with rituximab. So this big trial called the Murano trial randomized relapsed patients to either venetoclax rituximab or bendamustin rituximab. And the VR patients clearly did better. And that led to global approval of Venar. So if you're on a BTK inhibitor and you relapse and you don't go on a clinical trial or anything, in Cambridge you'd go on Venar. Now I give talks internationally, as with colleagues in a different part of the world, and I was giving a talk and they said, well, we always give Veno in relapse. And I said, well, the trials are not done in relapse and it's not approved in relapse. And they said, no, but it's obviously better. <laughs> But you can't. And, and I must stress, even in, if you're in a private clinic, and if you came to me and said, look, I want Veno, I'd say, you know, Booper aren't going to fund it. It's not approved in relapse. So in a UK healthcare setting, you get Venar. I've heard people say, well, that might be a better reason to have Veno first, because that's your only currently approved pathway to get a binatuzumab. So if you have a BTK first and relapse, you get Venar. If you want to have a binatuzumab, you've got to have it first line. But if people are waxing away and you can't make a decision, you can make it even more complicated. And you can say, did you see the Israeli data on COVID? People who had a binatuzumab had a higher chance of hospitalization than those who had rituximab. And then the person pushing for a binatuzumab scratches their head and they go, oh, OK, dog, whatever you say. <laughs> it is really difficult, isn't it? We're constantly trying to balance these risks. Uh, right. Do we know what the causes of CLR? are? Hmm. No. <laughs> it is so difficult. So it waxes and wanes. Is this driven by infection? Is it driven by autoimmunity? 
Is it a predisposing genetic state? Is it a variant on normal that we all eventually get CLL if you live long enough? Is it all of these things and then the random chance exposure to a bug, a protein or something that happened to trigger it in you? It is not that you used to smoke. It is not that you lived a wildlife in your youth. All the things that people come into clinic worrying that they're being punished for the sins of their youth. It's not. It just comes out of the blue. How is one treatment clean? Mm, uh, I want, did I use the word clean maybe in reference to side effects? I don't know. We're going to take that. Why do does, why does some patients have better side effect profiles than others? If Whoever wrote that wants to rewrite it, uh, I'll take it again. But if it's a side effect profile, side effects all reflect what a drug is targeting and the unexpected off-target. So if it targets something that you know has a side effect, so you stop gene A for protein A from working, and you need protein A to keep your nerves working or to keep your heart pumping, then that's what we call an on-target side effect. And you can balance the dose to try and maximize killing the disease you want to kill, whereas you're minimizing the side effect on your on-target side effect. But when you develop a drug and the classic is ibrutinib, developed because it targets BTK. When you start mapping out all the other kinases, so the kinases are these switch proteins, and we have thousands of switch proteins in our cells doing all of these clever things. And the other kinases, ibrutinib, can just latch onto it by mistake. And that's an understanding of atrial fibrillation as now has been worked out, this thing called SARC. Terminal kinase, a protein I'd never heard of until a cardiologist told us, actually, you need that to regulate the electrical signaling in the heart. And if you take mouse experiments and knock out this protein, you can give mice atrial fibrillation. How they measure that, I have no idea. But you can do that. And lo and behold, ibrutinib targets SARC T terminal kinase, terminal kinase as a sort of side effect. So that's how we know when you say, some is one treatment clean? Drugs can be refined to target their specific target more and more, and you get fewer of those off-target side effects. It's very difficult to actually get something incredibly clean in the lab. Can you please talk a little bit about sequencing treatments uh, when your CLL relapses, or the time relapsed after chemo? Yeah, so sequencing is quite a difficult area, and one of the reasons is Clinical trials are normally set up to look at a trial in that particular space. A pharmaceutical company has drug A and they want to look at it first line or they want to look at it at last line. They go to the regulators and say, if we show this advantage, will you then regulate and allow our drug to be sold in your healthcare environment? So that's what starts the development process with trials normally. So pharma goes to the FDA or the European Medicines Agency and says, we want to use this drug, we think this will work, this is our trial design. They work with the regulators right at the beginning, get approval and statistics and say, yep, if you meet these criteria, it's highly likely you'll be approved as long as you don't have bad side effects, et cetera, et cetera. They're not too fussed about sequencing down the line and they run their trial, they get the data and then often it's left to the trial groups or people like the CLL Forum when we collect real-world data, trying to ask this question, well, look, if you got treated with a BTK here and then venetoclax, or if you got chemo and then BTK, will the drugs keep working? And we extrapolate a lot from biology. So we'll say, oh, you know, a BTK inhibitor is, uh, works on that pathway and there's no mutation, so it's likely to work. And that normally is correct. So we can predict at a molecular biology level whether things are going to work, but not always. But the great problem, so this question is, can we talk about sequencing? We're often basing our decisions on relatively small, not exactly robust data sets. We tend to rotate. So if you've had venetoclax first, you're most likely to get a BTK inhibitor next. Or if you have a BTI, you'll go to venetoclax, because you can, we can all see the logic in that. When you've had chemo first, actually, you've got quite an open choice. In our clinics, you'd be offered Venar or acalabrutinib, and that would be an open choice, and it would be the pros and cons and what fits with you, et cetera, et cetera. 
The data that we've looked at, though, so whoever asked this question, I can encourage you that the data does look very encouraging, although not as robust statistically, but it does look as if you do respond quite nicely to the next one. And some of my patients who have been through loads of trials over the years and have cycled through, I've had one lovely patient of mine who managed to go through all of these different experimental, he went to BTK, then venetoclax, then came back onto a different BTK, then went on a pertubrutinib trial. That poor chap ended up dying from COVID. It's very sad, but um, just his CLL kept responding by just rotating through the drugs. So there is that scope. This whole thing about refreshing your clone, you hear people talk about that. If you've been on BTK, then you've gone venetoclax for two or three years, and then you relapse again, it might well be that your clone is no longer resistant to the BTK it was before, if you see what I mean. So good question about sequencing. I didn't include that in the slide deck, but... Uh, what are the suppressed immunity risks of ongoing BTK versus OVEN? Great question. That really is a good question. I told you we'd get really good questions. So, any of our treatments suppress the immune system. Fact. Can't escape from it in CLL. You're going in with a, a suppressed immune system anyway. You give our drugs and the immune system is suppressed. The hope with the fixed duration ones is you put people into a remission and if they stay in a remission two three four five six years that their normal hematopoiesis has a chance to try and re-establish itself and we do have some data for that for FCR that those patients who got the very deep remissions and you start mapping out years after the FCR how diverse their immune system is it does start to re-diversify of course if they relapse it messes everything up again so there is that hope. But venetoclax and abinutuzumab, that combination is powerfully immunosuppressive. I have a couple of my patients, and I don't know whether they're online, I'm looking around, they're not in the room here, who had a torrid time with COVID. One of my chaps was in hospital for over four months with COVID last year after venetoclax and abinutuzumab. Because it, abinutuzumab is really tough on the B-cell networks and venetoclax. Now, that's not said as a scare story, because I have many people with veno who've also been actually okay with COVID. You know what I mean? It's such a difficult thing with this immune thing and COVID and how some people are okay with it and some people aren't. But I'm slightly nervous of saying ongoing BTKI, bad because it's ongoing versus Veno, good because it's fixed duration. And BTK inhibitors, you know, they also suppress a strange bit of the a functioning pathway in the monocyte cells. It's all a bit detailed here, but... It's probably why there have been some very rare brain infections in BTK inhibitor patients. Uncommon in ibrutinib, but it's all because of this strange off-target effects impacting on the immune system. So when I say to patients about the drugs, I say, well, look, it's, it's really difficult because you've got these competing challenging things. You've got the bad leukemia we've got to treat and the challenges. You've got your immune system and we're all trying to get that balance, but if you don't treat the leukemia well, you're just not going to get, get anywhere. We've got to treat the leukemia, and then you're constantly trying to pick up the pieces in terms of supportive care measures thereafter. But obviously the COVID pandemic has been a massive challenge for our poor patients because their lives have been turned upside down. I've still got people who are, in effect, completely isolating three years down the line, and it is it's tremendously challenging. But Yep. Oh, in the cum. <laughs> I said there'd be loads of questions. So, my wife was diagnosed three months ago. Her lymphocyte count initially was 42. It's now 26. How common is this? So, CLL is a living thing. It fluctuates. And whereas, obviously, I'd far, someone starting with 42, it's far nicer to be 26 than 82 when you next see them. And I say, great, but don't overinterpret, because otherwise, next time when they come back and it's 37, they'll be depressed. So I draw out a graph, and I show the wobbling. You can have graphs that go like that. But CLL is a tremendously variable thing. And the lymphocyte count is just one of many things that we're looking at. I often say to my patients in the clinic, you know, starting a CLL treatment journey is very much a negotiated start point. CLL treatment decisions are actually, it's pretty uncommon for something to be an acute, an emergency. It's not a high-grade lymphoma. It's not the type of thing that you meet the patient in clinic. 
and, and occasionally you get a very late referral, but it's just not common. And so you track these things and you get a bit of a feel. So I would say, yeah, it's come down a bit, but don't pop the champagne corks. But like the same, so, you know, don't get too depressed if the next time it's 50. I mean, these things sort of wobble around. You really do have to get a picture. Um, is there a relationship between levels of immunoglobulins and levels of neutrophils? I'm going to sweepingly say no for the majority of patients because they are very separate branches of the hematopoietic system, the blood system. Neutrophils, for most CLL patients, they are not neutropenic, but a number of CLL treatments, particularly venetoclaxabinutuzumab early on, in those first few months, you can quite commonly get neutropenia. And sometimes the beta-K inhibitors as well. Zarnabrutinib perhaps a bit more than the others. It's some things you've just got to keep a bit of an eye out for. But biologically, that is separate from the immunoglobulins. Now, there is co-association. So somebody who's been treated, they've had more advanced CLL, they're more likely to have low immunoglobulins. And if they're on venetoclax, they're more likely to have low neutrophils. So you can imagine, aha, these two are linked. But I'm going to sweepingly say they're not linked. Apologies if this is going online, if there's someone in Ohio State who's done a research project on the linking of the two. <laughs> but in my practice, I'd say no. Are you saying chemo should not or will not be preferred treatment? And what is the availability of the newer drugs? So chemotherapy, there will be the occasional person for whom chemotherapy is still the right choice. The occasional person. Um, I think if you're in a healthcare environment when you can access the newer drugs, you've always got to ask yourself the question is, if you can access the new drugs, why would you access the older ones? There might be very specific quirks of side effects that push you that direction. But if you're saying, well, I've got mutated IGH3, I'm younger, I think the data with venetoclaxabinutuzumab is mature enough and we've randomised it in young people in the CLL13 trial. It's better than chemo. FCR has a 5% risk of myelodysplasia, which is a devastating, almost universally fatal side effect. And of course, there are side effects with everything. But I think choosing chemotherapy in this day and age, in our healthcare environment, I think, in my opinion, needs a bit of thought. And always you have to ask the question, why are you choosing chemo if you have access to the other newer drugs? What is availability of the newer drugs, BTK? So to remind you, in the UK system, we get label of a drug from the MHRA, so it gets approved for use in the UK, but we can't use it in the NHS clinics until it's gone through the NICE process. So NICE has to assess effectiveness. Now, we all know behind the scenes there's a huge amount of negotiating. And that's great for UK PLC, because we're getting good drugs, in effect, for a lower cost than the rest of the world. But it is great because the rest of the world also looks to NICE, which are very much perceived as this really solid badge of quality in terms of the effort NICE goes to assessing drugs. Are they effective for our patients? Are they going to benefit? And I know it's quite fashionable in the days gone by for people to get cross with NICE, but actually most of us working in the field are really supportive of NICE because they get us access to many, many good cancer drugs. They are fair in their appraisal and they are negotiating the cost to come down. But it does mean there is this hiatus. So drugs get labelled and we always feel slightly uncomfortable if you've got your boop or ax or your insurance, you can get that, and if on the NHS you can't. But most of the time this gap closes. So at the moment, Zanabrutinib is not yet NICE approved. Ibrutinib venetoclax is not yet NICE approved, but there are other great drugs on the NHS that you can use. The frustration for me is Acala plus Abinutuzumab because of technical reasons around how NICE look at the costing. And if they re-looked at it, you'd have to then throw in the cost of a binatuzumab that would make it non-cost effective, so it wouldn't be approved. So a calorabinatuzumab is not a combination that will be made available. Um, but by the end of this year, I suspect we're going to have availability of the other new stuff in the NHS clinics. I've been on watch and wait for nine years. My two sons are 56 and 54. At what age should they be tested? No. Oh, yeah. So I want to say don't test them. You know, it's a philosophical thing. Um, yeah. You test your 56-year-old and you find a lymphocyte count of five. Has that helped their quality of life? If they're well, 
don't test them. It's really bad, isn't it? That's paternalism. And I know paternalism shouldn't exist in medicine. You almost want to say is, get someone to test their bloods with a promise they're not going to tell you. You're just going to say they're fine, and you're never going to see the result. They're fine. <laughs> paternalism has gone in medicine. But actually, there are some aspects. It's quite interesting. When I, I saw a new patient yesterday, and I put this thing... Some people like to know every detail, side effects, potential things. And you get other people who say, you know what, doc, this is your job. You work in Cambridge, you're meant to know about it. I'm just going to say, you're fine. And I said, but I really should talk about this. And I said, I just, <laughs> it's fine. So I said, fine. <laughs> Prescribe the chemo. Not, lymph, not CLL patient. Uh, but everyone has to work out what is right for them. It is interesting, isn't it? Because for some people... They're very analytical, and if they don't know these details, they're just not going to relax in that way. And other people, um, you know, they, they just want, if they get a plumber to sort out their toilet, they don't want to know that actually the problems around the U-bend and that a gradient wasn't steep enough. That they just want to sort my toilet. But people are quite different. Uh, I'm just out of remission after BR. In 2019-2020, my brother in the US was diagnosed with CLL about the same time as me, and he was put on ibrutinib. But treatment suddenly stopped after scares in the US system. Has this changed UK treatment? Huh. That's quite a complicated question. So, ibrutinib got an international warning about cardiac events. So I touched on that that ibrutinib seems to tickle the heart. And it's quite hard to work out what percentage risk this is. We had a big UK data set that we presented at the American meeting just over a year ago, where we were looking at patients, and these were younger patients, because it was in the FLARE trial, and the chances of them dying of a sudden cardiac event. And what we showed is that people who started ibrutinib who were hypertensive, so had high blood pressure, or had previous heart disease, clearly had a significantly higher chance of, in effect, dropping dead on ibrutinib. And it's because of this cardiac effect of ibrutinib. And when you look at all of the trials of ibrutinib, particularly in the older people, there is this small percentage, hard to quantify what percentage that is. I have in my own mind a figure, but I'm not going to put it online <laughs> in the talk, but it's there as a small percentage. And, and so that led to a lot of problems with the regulators. So it was sent out around the world warning clinicians about this. And in the UK, we, because of the way we're set up, can move our patients to a calibrutinib. It's difficult, isn't it? Because if you've got someone who's 75, they've got a history of high blood pressure, heart problems, they're taking ibrutinib and they're really well. They have no side effects. It's quite a hard conversation to have, saying, you know, your risk of dropping dead is higher because you're on ibrutinib, and it, the risk is X percent per year. We can change you to another tablet, which generally is well tolerated, but for you as an individual, it might not be well tolerated. So you just sort of don't know. And some people say, look, doc, the idea of dropping dead fills me with horror. Um, I'll change. And other people say, dropping dead's not a bad way to do it. I'm just <laughs> going to stick with my ibrutinib. <laughs> And of course, I hear every conversation in the clinic. And what I worry, or not worry, I just, treatment was suddenly stopped after scares in the US. And I wonder whether the doc said, you know what, there is this risk. And there's a growing question about BTKs. If you've been on a BTK inhibitor for three or four years, particularly first line, and you're doing really well, actually there's quite a bit of data that says if you stop, you do not suddenly relapse. It can take a long time to relapse. And I've got patients who stopped ibrutinib quite a while ago. I think three years, three and a half years might be my longest. And their disease hasn't come back. So it's a bit counter to what I was telling you about BTK being this ongoing therapy. And it's entirely possible, because we don't know when you're talking about a case, but it's entirely possible that you know, there could be a cardiac history behind it. And the doc said, you're in a great remission. You've done brilliantly. Let's just stop the ibrutinib. And when your CLR wakes up, it might be a year or two, might be three years, we'll just put you on a calibrutinib at that point. So that pragmatic flexibility. And we've got a few patients like that in our clinic. I think we've got the last couple of questions there. Right. Two minutes. Ah, oh, can you talk about BTK degraders? I said there'd be people who are really into their CLR. So, we've talked about inhibitors. 
If you're a biotech company, you can stop a protein from working not just by putting in something that inhibits it, locks onto it, and it just won't work properly. You can actually do this thing called targeted degradation, whereby you have a clever linker that sticks like glue to the target you're trying to degrade and sticks like glue to another part of the biological sort of housekeeping machinery and targets that protein to be degraded, broken down. Biologically, it's a different thing. So you're not trying to inhibit it, you're trying to get rid of the protein. And there is now a wave of these new drugs, BTK degraders, starting to come through the system. I'm slightly conflicted because I spent a couple of years through COVID working on another degrader in another leukemia with another company, which currently is on hold. But it's a fascinating, the whole principle of trying to degrade proteins as opposed to inhibit proteins is a whole new wave of cancer biology that's coming our way. But the first... Uh, people have been dosed with these BTK degraders. Uh, there was some data at ASH. Small numbers. Don't want to overinterpret, but it's a watch this space. Uh, can you talk about side effects of A plus V in the trial, particularly joint pains, inflammation? Can you give me any advice? Hmm. So, of course, I can't give individual patient advice. Um, A plus V just like I plus V, that's A calibrutin plus venetoclax, that's going through the trial program, these combination therapies, uh, looking very exciting. Um, whenever you add these two drugs together, you do get more potential side effects. And joint pains, inflammatory joint pains, are a problem with all the BTK inhibitors. Actually, zanabrutinib and A calibrutinib are better than the first generation ones, but they are there. <laughs> In my experience, they often can be helped by dose reduction. Sometimes you have to do treatment breaks, occasionally a short burst of steroid. There are lots of tricks you can do. When you are in a clinical trial, of course, you are a bit tied into a trial protocol, so it's not always quite as easy. Right. 